Dennis Report is in-depth media for New Brunswick. We are supported by viewers just like you. If you'd like to support the show, go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. And Grand Chief of the Williston Green Williston okay. Council. Williston Grand Council. Okay, so it's not Grand Chief, just Chief of Williston no, Grand Council. Grand Chief of the Williston Grand Council. So there's two grants. <laughs> yeah. I'm there. <laughs> Good. Thanks for tuning in. Our guests today are Ron Tremblay, Grand Chief of the Williston Grand Council, and Jared Durrell, um, journalism student at St. Thomas University. Thanks, you guys. So that was a rough start, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so to begin, thank you for being here. Much appreciated. And um, top of mind is New Brunswick is kind of at a, a transition point. It's pretty obvious over the past 30, 40 years, uh, the way we've done things doesn't quite work so well anymore. And integral to how we now move forward will be a, a better understanding and relationship between First Nations and the rest of culture. I'll put them in that box that way. So can we kind of explore what that experience has been like for you guys living in New Brunswick and um, kind of bring us up today like we did it this way, now we need to do it that way. Mm. If that kind of makes sense, and we can pick any, any topic, but mainly it's just about understanding between all the different cultures. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and thank you very much, Dennis. First of all, to introduce myself, I'd like to pay gratitude towards uh, the ancestors of our land. So I'm going to do it in, in our what's the way language first. So I'm going to read them the Lazawaltam Wag, Genzus, Gizimenawak, Artid, Ladwa Waganen, Naga Oldaka Waganen, Naga Gizitu, did Nital Lagado Wagano, Lagado So anyway, um, first and foremost, I'd like to um, pay gratitude towards the ancestors of our people, the Wolastukeriig, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river, um, for they uh, kept our language alive and kept our ceremonies alive, as well as they created those peace and friendship treaties back in 1725 and 1726. So that's how we always begin our... Um, sessions and talks and ceremonies or meetings that we pay gratitude towards uh, our our past um, great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Jared, what do you want to start with? Um, I'm just grateful uh, for uh, Ron coming in today and all that. It's um, very important. You mentioned um, it's a transition point for New Brunswick, but it's not about New Brunswick so much. For the Wollastook people, it's a much bigger transition period. It's been a longer ongoing one, and I'm more grateful to be in this territory than anything because it's provided for me and my family for a long time uh, since we've been away from ours. So that's uh, the importance of this is, is big. It's uh, not just about New Brunswick. It's about everyone who lives here. And New Brunswick's younger, much, much younger than the Wollastook. And it's their territory and it's their lives that have been impacted harshly by New Brunswick. So the importance of this conversation, the importance of these changes is uh, everything. Um, just for the grandmothers uh, that I know that are out uh, from <laughs> in Minnesotan territory all the way out in the Mi'kmaq Key, uh, I'd just like to say uh, a water prayer that I was taught by Doreen Bernard, uh, who I know is working really diligently right now. Um, so as you can see, we're all drinking water because water is life. Uh, so, Law and Sam Kwan, guess hello, Gemite Amalolo, with love, with respect for the water, for the earth, for the things that have been protected by our ancestors before us. And that's Great. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Which invites a question about gratitude, integrating gratitude into everyday life. Is there, you want to offer some thoughts about that? And, and will that lead us through some of the challenges that we're looking at today? Most definitely, it will direct us into the area where we need to go today. Um, through my life, um, since I began following our traditional ceremonies and spirituality back, I think I was 28 years old when I started. Prior to that, I was um, forced to go to Catholic Church and then 
you know, follow the, you know, Catholicism and, and Christianity. We weren't taught in any way, shape, or form through our lives about our traditions, even though we had our language. Um, but we we uh, adopted a lot of the, and, and created words that would um, benefit uh, Christianity or Catholicism. So we had to create words like for God, for church, for prayer, for... So we didn't have those words before. Hmm. We had our, our old traditional words that... that um, was um, connected to the great mysteries, so to speak. So anyway, um, um, so through my whole life of ceremonies, through fasting, sweat lodges, and many, many various ceremonies, I've learned um, first and foremost as my feet uh, hit the floor in the morning to pay immense gratitude for, to all life. Um, and what what we don't realize is one one of my great great elders once told me that there is more life below our feet than that there are above our feet. So so where my gratitude starts is 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 the center of the earth, where that great great fire is, um, and all the different layers of earth, be it shale, um, 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 dirt. Um, water, uh, the aquifers down there, and all the life, that, that, the, the, the deep roots that are from the trees and, and from the pl plant life and all the, it, uh, the insects and the, um, the animals who live beneath our feet that sustains life. Because a lot of times what we don't see, um, we don't pay um, homage to or, or gratitude towards. So, so first and foremost, I, I go through each levels of the earth to her surface. Um, and I, I say her because we, we visualize the earth as our mother mm -hmm. because she, um, she gives us and, and, and provides every living thing or everything that we need to sustain life here on earth. So, I'm, and I pay gratitude to all the plant life, the trees, the waters, the streams, the lakes, the brooks, the oceans, the wetlands, because they're the ones, as Jared said, you know, water is life. Um, and I pay gratitude to all the four-legged, uh, uh, um, the winged ones, uh, the swimmers, the creepy crawlers, um, and, and all the mountains, the rocks, the valleys. And then um, at the end, I, I the, the um, spump cake we call the um, above world, which is where the stars live and, uh, you know, our, our father's sky and, and our grandfather's sun and, and, our, and our grandmother moon. So, but, what, but my prayer is usually a little, uh, a little bit longer than that. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's all in, in our holistic language. So. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Jared, you want to add to that? No, it's it's there. Uh, when Mi'kmaq in the Skamish and Nugamuch, what are um, the words in holistic? What what's that for? Uh, Niskamish is grandfather sun, and Nugamuch oh. is grandmother moon. Yeah, we say uh, Muslims we um, um, what Spadel said, which is grandfather who walks in 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 the the daytime through the sky, and Nugamuch we um, Nibo said is grandmother. Who walks through the sky at night? Hmm. So uh, we have a very descriptive and verby uh, language. <laughs> <laughs> what is fascinating, and thank you so much for setting us in that course, is that at some point all the various cultures need to find um, how to maintain their identities and how to find where the mesh is, or where the sweet spot is, or the sacred spaces that they all share so that we can get on with the things we need to get on with from 2020 forward. Um, and so to understand better how um, the culture puts itself as a piece of this much bigger picture, which would then guide an awful lot of the decisions that would come because you're part of something as opposed to it's there for me to use. Mm -hmm. yeah, if that kind of makes sense? Mm -hmm. hmm. And so moving forward with that then, in preserving the culture, how has it been? Um, mainstream media will report it in little snippets, 
um, with recovery of language and integrating language more into s school systems and such. And St. Thomas has done a pretty uh, nice job with placing it into institutional structures as a way of trying to recover it. But Jared, maybe you could talk a little bit to what it's like um, going to school nowadays, wanting to hang on to some of your culture, but then having to go to school. <laughs> It is it's not a repeat of, of the old you know the the ghost that still haunts us with the residential school system I, I but, don't have uh, that's not my place to talk uh, yeah but it, but you are the living version of it it's or is that putting you too much in a box <laughs> I don't think um, that's the point of um, I don't have the same kind of pain that uh, Ron has. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't. I've I've had it easier because of different experiences and different fights that have already been led. So uh, yeah. maybe to take it back, um, you only were able to at twenty eight get back to your culture. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Maybe before we have that conversation, is we have to get the groundwork. Okay. And um, yeah. just to clarify, I wasn't trying to compare the two. I was mm -hmm. just thinking you're the the next generation. And you're going through the school system, and, and uh, things sort of gotten a bit better. And, and I'm trying to yeah. fine tune something. I'm trying to show the difference between assimilation, which is a great risk from the francophone community and many other mm -hmm. communities, compared to oh, we found a balance now, and and now you can preserve and sustain and share your culture in this larger setting. So today's school versus schools from 40, 50 years ago. That's where I was yeah. trying to head with that. But just like a circle, we got to start at the start. Okay. And this isn't my territory. So. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't meaning to slide into residential school. That's that's a whole other topic. Yeah. But it was about today. Yeah. Well, just to go back when I was uh, back in 1966, I believe I started grade one. I I lived in the community of of Tobik, and I was uh, we were forced to go to a Christ, uh, um, Catholic day school. For the first four years of our, um, and it was pretty harsh. Uh, mind you, the conditions weren't as harsh as the residential schools, but uh, the the same uh, principles applied in in that school system is that they were trying to kill the Indian to save the child, so to speak. So um, we weren't allowed to speak our language, and at that point, uh, there was very little. Um, practice of our of our spirituality then um, and it was actually two sisters from our community Juanita and Marjorie Purley who went out seeking of, of our ceremonies um, they went to the um, Haudenosaunee um, confederacy to um, to bring back our ways so and and they were um, ostracized from our um, community because our, our community was uh, strictly Catholic so the priest and the nuns were the, uh, were kind of the dominance of our, of our community but when they brought back these ceremonies and, and these ways to our people um, they were shunned they were um, had to suffer a lot um, for their um, for what they did um, and and I have quite a, a um, funny story um, um, I went to church. It was a Saturday night, and I was—I might have been around like ten or eleven years old. And the priest, um, at the time, I was stood up during the sermon and said, "There's this group of Indians who came from another place, who's who's brought this devil worshiping here." And he says, "I really strongly urge you, parents, not to let your children go there, because they 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 worship the devil, devil, and they talk about." devil worshiping and so on well you don't tell a 10 year old boy where not to go so so r right after church I went home I jumped on my bike and, and it looked like I was biking away from where where the gathering was but but I made a great big circle and and went right there so there was a great big teepee set up there and there was um, um, many many uh, I, I think with 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 the with the um Haudenosaunee nation, there was probably six nations that came at at the time. 
and and I recall I was there with my friends and um, we kind of peeked in this teepee and there was an elder sitting there with with his sacred bundle he um, he had his pipe and his medicines there and he and he waved us in so we sat there so he um, he went to uh, put his pipe together and, and then the only words that I can recall was um, this can make you travel so I'm thinking as a 10 year old, um, uh, um, literally he's gonna get on that pipe and start flying around the TV. But, you know, I was pretty much um, disappointed when I didn't see him fly around the TV <laughs> with, with his pipe. So anyway, um, but, but later on in life when, when, when I was gifted um, a pipe through my ceremonies, I, I, I quickly understood and comprehended what what he was talking about during our, our pipe ceremonies it it takes you in a yeah. in, in a very sacred space and place and then later on that night they had um, a great big fire and they had a drum and they sang and they and I remember sitting there I'm um, next to my buddies and as that drum started I couldn't keep my feet still and I started to dance and I couldn't I I, I probably look like a, a fool dancing but um, I couldn't sit still, and that's the first time I felt so connected to who I was at the age of ten, and that was like a four-day, four-day um, gathering in our community. But when they left, it it, it kind of I, I felt a, a vacant hole in in my spirit because we were back to church and back to ten commandments and and following the ways of 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 the church and so on but that was the first um the introduction that i had with our um beautiful ceremonies and culture and so on no. great tara do you have thoughts on your journey with when you got reconnected with some things um, well it's different for me because um I was born out west, and I am not connected to one side of my family, so there's already a big part missing. Mm -hmm. But for the family here, um, and I'm going to speak briefly because my family doesn't, that's the thing too, is when you have a family, you have to worry about their opinions of everything. And I love my family, and I worry about them, but they don't like talking about it because that's how they were raised, is it's not something to talk about or discuss. Mm -hmm. And that, in my understanding that that comes from having things taken away and being hurt over it is you just don't want to associate to the pain of the loss. Uh, so uh, just to put it out there is a big thing in the communities is blood quantum, how native is a native and what is the merit that gets you in? Like, um, because I don't know if the audience is going to know, but like there's a big cutoff uh, because of institutional policies. There's been, uh, there's been so much work done to destroy the cultures because there's lots of them. There's, hundreds and thousands and so many unique important parts that connect to the environments that we've lived in and as people and that's all been stripped away over less than 150 years uh, over longer uh, since like the colonization of North American stuff but I come from two people some mixed peoples in my background uh, I, I wasn't aware of any of this until high school I wasn't like I was aware of who my family was. I was aware of Miramichi and uh, I aware of who the Mi'kmaq were and stuff like that. But I didn't understand. Well, this is a guy named Duncan Campbell Scott who made this policy until high school. I wasn't aware of how the moving parts were. It was all um, it was all hidden. Is uh, is you you wake up every morning. You know who your parents are. You know who your grandparents are. But you don't know why they're sad. You don't know why uh, something's missing. You, you just know what's up. Uh, for that so over the last I'd say five years it's been a lot more uh, hands-on experience because the opportunity's been there because great people like Ron have been going out of their way to keep it going it's carrying it forward and there's a lot that gets in the way of that there's a lot of uh, I you haven't been paid a day in a life to take care of your culture you haven't been provided for to do what is necessary to make sure your grandchildren and other people have what they need is you have to fight and that's a that's a very serious thing that's all i'm aware of at the end of the day most of the time is it's a fight is mm -hmm. it's it's an ongoing struggle and that's why it's very pertinent it's it's not about me so much because there's a couple hundred other people i know right off the bat that have the same experiences that i'm going through and more there's uh indigenous peoples that live in cities that are totally away from anything that's important to them and so 
whatever they're given is whatever they'll take because mm. they know there's something missing. I have a friend uh, who's uh, he's black and native, so he's got a mix again. And so that means he's welcome sometimes, he's not welcome other times. <laughs> I know people that are white and native and they look super white, but they're full-blooded or whatever. Um, but the thing is, is we have this thing imposed on us, a meritocracy of what makes us who we are. And that's the missing part is it's not something you get to go out and determine and participate in. It's something that's given to you and you're just expected to keep that. And where we're at now is there's a lot more opportunity to fight and change that and participate. So what we're looking at is a new chance to actually become in your space. Like uh, the Miramichi as uh, a Mi'kmaq territory, it uh, was settled and the French moved in. Uh, they were avoiding the English loyalists and such, the Acadian expulsion. And then they mixed, and that's where my background comes from, is from Mi'kmaq and French. But if I bring this up in conversation with some people, it's immediately addressed as, well, do you have the right to talk about this? And I don't. I, well, I do and I don't. Yeah. It's weird. And I'm rambling so much and I'm wasting time. But the point is, is it's a conflict, is just to be able to say if you have the space to live in. Is yeah. what space do I have the right to exist in, and what do I exist as? You're never wasting time, number one. <laughs> it all counts. Mm -hmm. Number two, that model you just described and your version of, of that part of your journey really brings us to today because at some point we need to talk about that, surface it and share it, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. But then <clears throat> the next question is, okay, now how do we move forward? Because it is a model. And to me, that's exciting. When things are a little chaotic, when systems are shifting, when the way we've done it for 40 or 50 years doesn't work anymore, then we get to play. We get to create mm -hmm. new stuff. and But we have to learn how to dance together. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out where the pieces fit and, and how it becomes joyful rather than uh, task or exploitative. Or mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So the model to me becomes good because okay, if this is, and if we can position ourselves into the present because this is the way it is today, then what are the exciting bits that you see, each of you, that would move us forward? And we could pick, you know, we could pick any large social issue, um, cis and mine, um, how we treat the land, um, glyphosate. We could do it that way and pick an issue and then explore how we could be doing it better. Or we could talk about the new pattern should sort of look like this. So decisions should be made all together before you know so consultation takes on a different tone rather than the decisions really made we're just coming to the public to find out what feedback is and figure out how to negotiate out of it so the, the obligation or duty to consult for example mm -hmm. a mechanism that was put in place that doesn't have the same grounding as how you opened our, our conversation today mm -hmm. so imagine having a discussion about a large thing healthcare reform mm -hmm. but the grounding is radically different mm -hmm. for was done with gratitude rather than how do I win <laughs> I'd like to go back uh, to the early 90s when I was up at UNB I was taking courses there and um, um, during the Native Awareness uh, Week um, they had invited uh, uh, an elder from Manawaki named uh, William Commanda. Now, William has passed now for the last, I think, 10 years or so. But I recall I was like 30-ish uh, younger, um, and I was sitting right in the front, and um, I recall his his grandson, um, literally dragging this suitcase in to the um, space we were at, and the suitcases uh, back then were uh, before wheels. <laughs> <laughs> the wheelie one. So anyway, um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking, wow, what's in there? Rocks? Like, and then his, so his grandson unfolded this huge wampum belt, which these, these here are little wampums here. Mm -hmm. um, there was a huge wampum belt, what he called the prophecy belt. And it was approximately a foot wide by, um, by around 25 feet long. And if you can imagine wampums, like one little wampum like this, like a, a foot wide by you know, 25 feet long, this was a huge wampum. And weight, this this is weight here, but if you would, you know, try and lift that up yeah. by yourself. Yep. So, um, so um, 
what William did is he started from the beginning of this prophecy built. And he went from the creation story, from how we were created. And it's such a different creation story than the Christian or any other creation stories. It was very specific to our ways, um, you know, how we think about the great mysteries. Um, um, I, I know most most religions have only one God or 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 sometimes numerous gods, mm -hmm. but but we in in our language have Kchiniwesk, uh, which is the feminine great mystery, and Kchiminda, which is the masculine great mystery. They're the ones who came together at the beginning to create life. And if you look at the physical and spiritual world of today here in our lives, it takes two to tango and create life, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Hopefully not. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we're here, right? Yeah. Because our, our parents. Uh, yeah. So, um, so um, William went from the beginning to this, um, uh, to the, um, close to the end, but he didn't finish the whole um, prophecy because he wanted us to project what we thought the um, the the future should unfold, mm -hmm. um, as as he was going through each symbol, as as you see here, that there's a lot of symbols in in, in this little wampum, and and he described each symbol, what they meant was a part of that prophecy, so he eventually came to the present day. This this was probably 1993, 94 around there, so he said. Um, and I can, I, I can remember him pointing at me. He said, you will see this, but I'll be gone. Mm -hmm. He says, there'll be a great shift. And, and you mentioned the word shift a little yes. while ago. Yeah. He says, it will be the awakening of the rainbow warriors, what he called them. He says, many young people will awaken and, and start to realize um, that the path um, that humanity is going on right now is in a very dev uh, in, in, in a um, very devastating path and it needs to readjust back to the original ways that we're supposed to be you know um, um, uh, respecting the earth and living in this balanced way mm -hmm. so he said um, so he gave uh, the description of a rapid um, rapid river and he said these these rainbow warriors which will be led by our people the indigenous peoples of the world the these young people will jump in that rapid and they will flow down these rapids knowing the fact that's the way that they need to go it's going to be rough mm -hmm. but but the the end will be you know um very very like prosperous in 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 a way a greener a greener futures mm -hmm. And um, he says, but there'll be some who will jump in at the beginning and will be afraid of the rapids and start grabbing the sides and the roots and trying to crawl back up and, and they'll drown. And there'll be people just standing at the edge and just watching, you know, all it go past. And he says, those ones will, will, will kind of sort of miss the boat. Of of the you know of of the more prosperous green future of our ways, so um, back in uh, during the Elsie book the conflict of of the fracking, um, I was up there. I, I was I was arrested and you know I don't want to get into that, but uh, mm -hmm. um, um, but I I remember the day before I was um, cuffed, <laughs> so to speak, and. Uh, um, um, John, John Levi, who was the war, uh, warrior chief up there, and I were speaking to the RCMP, and, um, and we were trying to negotiate how peaceful we can, you know, uh, uh, resolve this, this conflict in, in, in a peace, a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of looked back where we were at, uh, meeting with these RCMP, and it was, at this crossroads, yes, and I remember William Commanda said, "You you will come to a crossroad, and you'll have to choose which way you want to go. Yes, you want to go continue on on this continuum of destruction, 
or there's this peaceful way of living in balance with the earth and water and the air and all of life. Mm -hmm. So I remember, wow. And that, you know, this, this was like back in 1993. So I was, you know, reflecting back of that we were at these cross, literally, <laughs> literally at these crossroads meeting. And that's where I was arrested that next morning, yep. right at those crossroads. Yep. So it was kind of uh, um, symbolic and so on. So um, so these but, but, uh, these beautiful teachings from William Commander, just, it, it just gave me, and I don't like to use the word hope or faith because they're just a, a hmm. fluffy word. Yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, with our ceremonies, we have to follow up with the, uh, with the ceremonies and to act. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we can pray all we want. Um, if, if we're starving, we can pray all we want and, um, you know, open our mouths, but food's not going to fall in. Yep. Yep. We have to go and do something to get food. So. And, and that's why I asked the question about um, we have to learn to dance together mm -hmm. or play together. Um, because it's pretty obvious to this moment in time that... We have so much information and so much knowledge, no matter which way we look. So when we look backwards, we, we know a lot of the different parts of the story, and it's very complex. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're also starting to recognize that in 2020 that something needs to change, that shift that needs to occur. A lot of systems that we counted on don't work anymore, and we're exploiting. There's just too much damage going on, and we're starting to wake up enough to stop the damage. But the bigger question is, and I run into it almost every day when working with different groups and talking, is like, okay, but how do we move forward? It's like they don't know how. They're so used to doing it a certain way that to invite, oh, um, you know, that's the goal, but how we're going to get there is going to be a different way. You know, So the strategy might be, oh, we want to win a Stanley Cup, but I can't tell you what the score of each game is going to be. We just have to go play a good mm -hmm. game, to use that analogy. Mm -hmm. So at a very, very large scale, we're sort of not stuck, but paused because we're looking for a way forward that integrates all the different pieces into a new path, the Rainbow Warrior path, actually. Um, and Jared, you're the one that's going to kind of be that in 2050 and 2060, you know? If I make it that way. <laughs> no, it's, it's a joke, of course, but like, we're but, not paused. We're paused. We've yeah. been on pause for a long time. Good. And I mean, I, don't, I can't even say we because there's differences. <laughs> We're in a different path. Yeah. We live in the same space, but there's different barriers that exist for people. The province isn't paused right now. They're going on for resource extraction. And there's these, and I don't mean to bring shame or to target anybody, but a lot of people have no idea about any of this. Yeah. They're scared of it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to be involved. They, indigenous issues is a scary word to people. They're terrified of it. And to them, that's just a voting topic. And if they see someone say, um, like the NDP guy, he said he was going to repair relationships. But in his own area, his own riding of British Columbia, where he lives, there's one of the most monumental issues right now where it was just leaked that they were ready to go in with lethal force to clear out the Unistotin. Yeah. Lethal force was approved. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's terrifying to think that that's on the other coast. But here, and I don't want to bring up those issues, but it's still ongoing the resources are being extracted it's all about uh people who aren't on pause people who have what they need and keep getting more and the system is still in play and it's like if you're playing a game and like say one team's got seven penalties because the ref's totally corrupt yep. it's, it's a bad game and the other team's just mowing it going through because all the other players have been either separated uh, they've been taken away, they've put them off the field, or they've been injured, or they've been, uh, there's been things done to them. Like it, the analogy is getting too true now yeah. because the reality of it is, is it's not fair. And that's uh, like, I get what we're saying about the generation waking up, but waking up to something being unfair is difficult mm -hmm. because it means, first off, to acknowledge a pain that exists, uh, the immediate concern of being hurt and trying to fix that hurt. But there's a lot of things in this world that will try and fix that hurt that aren't great for you, that will actually put you on a worse path. Mm -hmm. And that's overwhelming. Uh, so the immediate need is for elders. The immediate need is for, and I just want to bring this up because you're cuffed, you're arrested, you're detained, and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know because they're taking that freedom from you because you're standing your ground and you're doing what's right. And so someone whose job is to come in and take you away is going to do that and you don't know because your freedom's taken away 
that means all that work, all that you carry in your bundle, all that you've shared can be snuffed out. Hmm. And I know it won't because the first time I met you, uh, well, actually, I learned about most of this in high school because Dov Wilson, a friend of yours, taught me. Hmm. I grew up around Wellamoktuk, which is a Wulistuk community. And because of all the work that's been done, I was able to step in the circle and see things and actually participate. I've gone on to uh, go to uh, the Alton gas site in Shubenacadie. I've been there. I've seen how uh, land expulsions are done, how people are detained and how people are threatened and monitored for trying to protect their water. I've been able to uh, stand and the first time I met you in person was at a Tina Fontaine rally over the tragedy that befell a woman who was put into foster care, a child, a girl. And I know people who have been taken from their families and put into foster care, so that was important to me. And being able to see how it's impacted the Woolastook and how important it is to you and the grandmothers, because you you work with the grandmothers, you work with the traditional peoples that existed before the Indian Act. You work for the generations and the peoples that exist without the damage. And you're trying to fight to get back there. And that's the thing, is when you're in cuffs and they're going to snuff that out, that's heavy. That's It's genocide. And it's a scary word, but it is. It is, in effect, trying to destroy, eliminate, and control a culture. And, uh, like, you ever hear the saying, the, the salmon will run again? And, like, mm -hmm. some of those big prophecies. Is it, it's not just about... It's not metaphysics. It's not saying like, like you said, what you can't, you can just pray, but you do have to find food mm -hmm. and you can find good or bad food, but you also have to provide food for the people around you in your community, your circles. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing that. So again, I'm rambling, but, um, that's where we're at is we actually have to start having these conversations mm -hmm. and the premier of the province won't sit down for these conversations. Mm -hmm. They've elected someone like, cause the Canadian voter, they go out and they vote for someone to <clears throat> handle a job for them. They don't make it personal. They put that responsibility on someone else. And that's the biggest issue we have is, uh, I know someone uh, in the provincial offices, who's, his name's Jake Stewart, he's elected to be Aboriginal Affairs of the province. And I've gone on to talk to the ombudsman and the environmental ministers, and even they are more aware of what's going on in Sissonbrook than he is. So how come we're voting for someone to take care of a job when they're going and they're, they're, they're destroying your environments, they're not even hearing you out when you say that, well, we want to protect Mount Carlton. They won't listen to you. They want to put so much more barriers in front of you to even talk about protecting something that's important to you. And it's overwhelming, it's irritating, yeah. and it's regrettably where we're at. That's excellent because it shows how big the gap is between where the path could be if we would just adopt it to what you're experiencing with how you move through the world. And that's where we gotta go. We have to go right into that space of that gap about how do we bring these pieces together in a positive nurturing way, as opposed to the, the model that's gotten us to where we are today mm. and all the pieces in history. So, and thank you for wandering into that space because it's a big important space. In some ways you can describe it as it's in the shadow world. Um, here's what we do day to day and, and we kind of chunk along, but over here the biggest influence is all the stuff that's not being said and it needs to come forward and be integrated somehow. <clears throat> I had done a small commentary um, after the last provincial election because it was a minority government and mainstream media kept portraying it as a negative thing. And I thought, no, it's a system has just changed. There's been a shift in the voice somehow in that system. So you've now got four voices. So I did this little rant and said, now if you could just bring First Nations in and you've got the Queen's representative and you've got four voices, you almost have a circle. <laughs> yeah. So in your view, do you th is there a window of time? Because it has to start to happen now. Or are the voices, much like Jared spoke to, how they're being excluded? But mm -hmm. in your world, is there a window now in the next five years, ten years, where that decision-making process and a premier or a, a political system such as it is can adapt just one more little step to integrate a different process for how the, the large-scale decisions are made, which then gets into the gratitude of protecting water and protecting mm -hmm. land and knowing that you are part of it? Or have I wandered into a too awkward a space because it's too soon? It's, 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 it's a huge question because um, um, Federally, yeah, you're talking provincially, but but federally, mm -hmm. um, the liberal government trying to push through through a bill to um, to pass. Um, I don't know if it's just the principles of the United Nations declarations 
on the rights of indigenous peoples um, and then on the on on the same note they're trying to push this framework agreement through the same time and get rid of the, the Indian Act um, but this framework agreement is pretty much parallel to the white paper of 1960s that Crunchier was trying to push through through um, through um, Justin's dad Pierre mm -hmm. um, um, it it's it's a pretty much a termination um, policy for us and how that's going to affect our treaties we've here in the East Coast, the Peace and Friendship Treaties, we have the strongest, most uh, vibrant um, treaties here, because within the treaties there was no, no um, wording or no statement of surrendering any mm. lands or resources. Mm. So, why wouldn't the federal government want to null and void those those, those powerful documents? Because once they and it and they want to create modern day treaties hmm. so they can negotiate and um, and this isn't to um, to um, downplay the role of chief and councils in the communities but who they represent are the people the, the members of their communities in in their communities and not outside their community um, and I say that word members because Membership, you know, you can become a member of a golf club or a boat club or a yacht club, whatever. Mm. And that's how um, this membership policy in the communities are, is, is very, very regulated in, in who can become a member. So, and the chief and councils um, are just a branch off of the federal government. They are controlled through policies and through funding so they're really just an employee of the federal government mm -hmm. so so when the federal government says they want to negotiate with with these first nations even the word first nation is is a dirty word to me um, a reserve is not a first nation you can't call a reserve a nation it's it, it's a reservation it, it has a number um, uh, stuck to it, you know, each each reserve has a number, hmm. you know, one, two, I think there's, I don't know how many, 600 and some communities across Canada, so, uh, so they each have a number, and they have to follow these strict policies of the government through the, uh, through the Indian Act, and how their voting regulations, their membership, and, and their policies that, that regulate them in and on the reserve. So these reserves are just federal institutions, as, as Elder Danny, Danny Innes calls it. It's a, it's a concentration camp, a modern-day concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And if you see across Canada the conditions of a lot of the, the communities with they can't drink their water, they're... they're they're next to either a tar sand or, or a mining or a city that's that's draining their water systems. So, um, so this term First Nations is such a false uh, impression and false hope to our, our people that they belong to this great nation. Mm -hmm. We as the Wolastogwig are part of a nation. The Mi'kmaq are a nation. The Passamaquoddy are a nation the Penobscot, and so forth. Um, we don't live on First Nations. <laughs> it's such false hope to our people. It's I'm not sure where that catchphrase came from. I think back in the 80s or something, somebody... So, yep, come up with a different phrase for the same old problem. Yeah, so so up. it's, it's again, it's like... Um, and, you know, um, you know this, this is a sad fact. You know, we've... We have the highest cases of suicide, of um, addictions, of foster, like I think 60 some percent of the children in foster care are from indigenous communities. What what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. it, those are modern days residential schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, and 
and um, still the province and the federal governments create the policies that regulate our, our child welfare, which which is our horrific cause. And in this case, just just here in New Brunswick, there's you know, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but there's a very few people who are non-indigenous who has made literally hundreds of thousand dollars um, dollars off um, foster care. They are living wealthy mm -hmm. because uh, of, of our children going to their homes. So it's, um, um, again, you know, you open up a really huge can of worms. Um, I've been at the, at the United Nations uh, Indigenous Permanent Forum the last six years. And uh, um, horror stories that I've heard from indigenous people across the world is just horrific. It's just, um, I remember, I think two years ago, I literally left there um, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally sick. I was sick and thank, uh, I, I was so thankful that this uh, Ojibwe grandmother was there who, who came to sit with me and she done a ceremony with me and she kind of lifted that darkness um, you know, from me and so on. And um, listening to Canada at that like world stage is really sickening. Um, them them repeating how how great they they've reacted to the undrip and how great they are in in resolving the homelessness, the poverty, the addictions, the and the statistics are still the same. Nothing has improved. So anyway, it's just it's um, it is mind blowing that and in, in fact a, a good friend of mine Danielle, um, who's from El Salvador, came here uh, a month ago, before Christmas, and, and um, he viewed a film of what's going on in El Salvador and what happened back in 1967 of the genocide that happened. Uh, uh, sorry, 1932, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and and he was shocked to hear the conditions of our communities here. He thought, you know, yeah. by listening to the world leader, world leaders of Canada, that everything was hunky-dory here, that we were like, <laughs> you know, they were treating their First Nations people with, uh, oops, uh, I just swore. <laughs> it's all right. Indigenous yeah, peoples, <laughs> uh, indigenous peoples of, um, of, 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 of this country with, with other more, um, respect and so on which, yeah. which is totally false yeah. um, I was there when Carolyn Bennett read um, the statement that Canada fully supported the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples without qualification and that's the first time the permanent form received an, a standing ovation and I didn't stand and, and my friend Daniel was sitting next to me he says how come you're not standing he says you know, Daniel, we, we've heard this song and dance so many times. Hmm. I said, I want to see what's going to happen now. The action hmm. is means more than words. And I had a chance to address and and um, be face to face with uh, Minister um, Bennett after her speech. So I I I, I recall I'm um, confronting her. I said, Carolyn. I said, when we get back home, I said. Who will be sitting at those tables discussing how this undrip is going to unfold? And and will there be grassroots people and traditional governments going to be at that table? She said, well, we haven't thought that far ahead. And I said, hmm, I kind of doubt that. I says, I bet you you've had your policy people and your lawyers figure out how this is going to unfold. I, I, I said, I, I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen is we're going to get back home and that there'll be selected um, indigenous leaders who the federal government has control o over that will be sitting at those tables. Three months later, what happened when we got home? They only selected the Assembly of First Nations who they control to sit at those tables. There was no traditional governments. There was no women, um, um, native women groups. There was no native youth. Just the ones that they controlled. And, you know. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.
And thank you for wandering into the deep end in a way, because we have to. That's the moment in time we're in, and that's the pleasure of the show, is that we have the space and time to kind of go into the nooks and crannies a little bit and go, okay. And and it's also very different from just um, speaking to the past, because both of you are bringing it into present tense. And we have about 10 or 12 minutes left. So if we follow that story arc for how today is unfolding from beginning with gratitude to speaking to recent events and some personal stories, people need to hear how we move forward. What does it look like? And, and it's a tough question because it hasn't happened yet, but it's very clear we need new action or a new relationship or a new form of play together to create what the world will become next. And the Rainbow Warriors need their voice now, and they need that space to share the voice, and the audience needs to hear it, because it's going to sound very different <laughs> than what we've done for the past 30, 40 years, and both of you have, have been examples of it. So can we try to push the conversation that way a little bit, so that if someone watches the full show or listens to the full show, they go, okay, they started here, and then they went there, and then we went into some shadow stuff, and now... Oh, that's what we need to do. Okay, then I can support that. So we can give them some sort of guidance that way. I think a big thing is, uh, is the people that need to be moving need to be moving. The people that have been moving already need to slow down. Uh, the province right now is looking to do a new three-way partnership with Manitoba and Saskatchewan to develop nuclear reactors. And uh, they want to produce uh, and commodify things. So that means they're going to take parts of their provinces, their territory that they manage, and they're going to start draining a resource. The reason I bring it up is because that seems alarming for three provinces that are still in the throes of saying they're in the middle of reconciliation, which I know isn't a great word because it's a buzzword, it's a fluff word. Mm -hmm. It is a word that satisfies someone else's uh, need to feel like they're doing the right thing. And uh, I've got professors and elders in a great community that I get to talk to and participate with. And the big thing is the management of funds. This goes through Indian Affairs or uh, the Department of Northern Aboriginal Affairs or whatever they call it now. And it's going to be still, the power doesn't rest with the people that need it. It doesn't go to grassroots organizations. It goes to uh, foster care programs. It goes to uh, governmental branches that are going to acquire that wealth and things like that. Uh, at the university, a man came in to uh, recruit indigenous students to the uh, Department of Aboriginal Affairs. And a big thing is they say, well, they want to indigenize. Now, if I go to an elder, uh, a doctor that I know, and I ask him about it as well. We don't need to indigenize. We need the money that we're supposed to be having that's been promised to us. Or we need access to the lands that we actually live on. We need to have an unrestricted existence. And that's the kind of conversation we have to be having, I think, is uh, it has to actually be out there. And the people that have the biggest say in it are people that aren't actually involved, which is almost ridiculous, is that a lot of people go out and vote for parties that they want to be in power. And Carolyn Bennett was appointed because she belongs to the Liberal Party and the Liberal Party won. The Liberals were voted in because a lot of people were satisfied for voting for that. A lot of people would vote for Conservatives because they're satisfied by that. Mm. It's not about instant gratification. You shouldn't be gratified by your choice. You should actually be putting the effort in. And if you say you want to be an environmental uh, world or you want to be in a safe world, you want to have grandkids that can eat and drink and sleep on the land and live that way, or they want to be safe and they want to have a future, then you have to be fighting for that future regardless. And for everyone, that means holding people accountable, I think. Um, for the last two years, um, we've taken uh, uh, youth to the United Nations. So um, I've, I've tried to work with the um, elected chief and councils and have them uh, unify with, with the traditional Grand Council, but that's kind of um, fallen to the side. Uh, some agreed, some didn't agree, and I was just, um, um, I guess the energies that, that I was putting towards that were, um, were, were, were pretty much being drained. So I had to refocus as um, a traditional leader, and I've talked to the grandmothers so our focus is with our young people like Jared here. So when we first um, traveled with six youth uh, two years ago and last year, like we uh, we took nine youth. So so my focus is towards uh, future leadership. 
and um, and these young people that we took were ranged from the ages of 20 to I think 29 or 30 and um, they've they've had their foot in Western institutions so they got either received their degrees through um, Western institutions but on on a good note is that they still have their foot in, in our traditional um, way of, of of thinking principles and morals so so <coughs> so so my focus is towards our young people um, um, and and they're the change so I'm kind of fulfilling the prophecies of William Commander that he received from his great great grandfather is that this whole shift that's going to take place is going to going to be on the shoulders of our young people um, we as older people are just there to guide and direct them because they do have as um, um, Albert Marshall um, tagged it as two eyed seeing is that you have a Western um, way of seeing things but you have a traditional way of seeing things so I'm focusing on our young people who are who are um, have carry both both uh, systems of seeing um, and I have total faith in and I shouldn't say faith but I have total <laughs> um, of commitment and I know things will change because um, they've they've seen what's what's happening today and they want a better future for their children and um, you know our, our our mother earth is being attacked there's this equal genocide that's happening you know just just here in, in this province in, in Wallastog and Megama and um, past Macquarie territory you know that there's been clear cutting and spraying and and um, and proposed mines and um, and proposed uh, um, pipelines and so on. So we're always, it seems to me, we're always on the defense, and we need to switch that to um, an offense. And, and that's 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 our job is to you know, create these powerful young, you know, intellectual young people, but wise. Hmm. You know, um, uh, we have this a uh, seventh fire prophecy. And there's an eighth fire, the eighth fire. See, we're we we're the we're the seventh fire, the ones that are in the ages of leaning towards the uh, the end of our lives. We're the ones who carry the the uh, the um, the embers of the seventh fire, and lighting the uh, the eighth fire. And these are these young people. These are these the these uh, rainbow warriors that are going to come forth and because they're going to want a better life for their children and 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 grandchildren mm -hmm. so i totally trust <clears throat> in in these young people and i know for sure um that there was a time and space and that i had complete hopelessness and doubt that things were going to change but um just just rubbing shoulders with these these extreme, you know, extremely wise and, and bright young people gives me um, assurance that things will change. <clears throat> to play with a specific example of touch, thank you for that. <clears throat> so when it comes to our relationship with land, for example, and when it comes to the cultures um, fitting together better, I'm Rather, so you maintain your, your distinct identity, but you also know that you're part of a bigger thing. And then the gratitude element of land. So I was imagining, as you both spoke, um, the business types or the types that want to develop because they see land is there for me to take or to use rather than I have a reciprocal relationship with it and I need to be more balanced. They would be pushing back pretty quick about jobs. So you want to stop, you know, the exploitation of the land, but what are you going to do about jobs? Because we need jobs. That never comes up on the other side of the equation um, in terms of they don't see that there's other ways of having a relationship with the land that will sustain the very question that they're asking. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears> there's other responsibility. So, yeah, there's other ways of doing things, not just this way. And you will speak to the connection with the land, but... It would be fun to try to play, well, what would those jobs look like? To start to answer their question on their terms. 
if that makes sense, but slid into a new framework or a new context. That this job now doesn't leave a mess behind for five mm -hmm. generations from now. This job actually made it better for them five years from now. It seems to be the missing piece for them, and they, and they mm -hmm. can't quite see, well, mm -hmm. well, if you take that away, what takes its place? We're looking at sustainable things when we don't really need sustainable, we need sustenance. We need to know what we have is enough. We need to be able to provide in like a yearly round. We need to be providing in a harvesting or replenishing model. Or, because I'm jumping the gun here, is we got to be acknowledging first off what the hell is actually out there. How much money is being spent on this? These jobs have to exist because people don't have an education to do anything else. Trades are reliable. Trades is great work. But trades are great work because there's so little opportunity to do anything else sometimes. Because you need to do something. I think everyone should have a trade. I think everyone should be educated to participate in their communities and do every job they need to do. I think it, a university should be more accessible, of course, because it's such a barrier. As, oh, no, that person doesn't know anything. They didn't go to university. Bullshit. Pardon my language. Is we have traditional leaders who should be at the table every damn day and it treated respectfully as such because they are there. They live. They represent a community that trusts them, that believes in them. Instead, we have someone with a degree in something that gets appointed into Aboriginal Affairs and it reads from a script written by a party manager. Really, we're not looking at it critically enough. We're not being responsible with all the pieces are out there. We live in the same world. We're just not looking at it the right way. You know, we have two, well, more than two um, Western institutions here in, in the city is if 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 we created some sort of space for them for you know greener you know you know initiatives and, and training you know as Jared said is that you know in, in in like solar and wind power to train people to and you know I I just uh, was visiting my um, my 10 year old grandson in New York and he's he's a quite a little um, you know, um, an intellectual young man who loves reading. And I said, you know what? I said, what I want you to do in the future is create something that's going to help um, purify water because water is going to be the next um, so-called resource as, as the Western it sees it, but it, you know, we don't see it as a resource, but mm. a way to save and to, to um, filter it so we can drink it because... It's going to come a time that I, I remember, I, I can recall my grandfather said that Third World War will be over water. And he said that back back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was like 96 when, when he passed. So he knew, he seen life as it was evolving in, in, in a negative way. So um, so I, I I really, and, and you know, yeah, you look at UNB who's, who, who receives a lot of funding from the Irving family, and so who's in, through their forestry pro program and science, so who are kind of shifting towards the, you know, preserving their um, the ecosystem or their 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 eco or that uh, oh no their um, uh, monocultures that that they're producing, you know you know one type of tree and, and and trying to prove that spring you know glyphosate is safe. You know, they're so they're kind of putting money into those sciences to to have them, um, you know, you know, to pay them to say that you know these that that these chemicals are safe to use. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we need to um, take back our territory and take back the province and give it back to the people. UNB should be giving back the amount of acres that they have that they've sold into forestry programs like people see forestry and they think oh it's green it's environmental it's not a monoculture is unreliable a monoculture can fail the reason they have to be spraying glyphosates to protect that monoculture is because there's no balance there's no homeostasis it doesn't take care of itself because it's manufactured that's not real environmentalism and that's not benefiting the Wollastook it's not benefiting any of the peoples that live there it's benefiting people who are going to harvest it and sell it as a commodity mm -hmm. and like Look at the lack of birch trees now. Mm. Birch trees were a resource to build canoes. They were a resource to make, to love, to cherish. And there's people responsible for that. In the process of colonization, you can look at the environmental impact of a colony. I had to explain this to a Nigerian. Nigerians are a, an African nation that were subject to really cruel uh, colonization. And he said, well, you guys are environmental. It's not that bad. And I was like, no, it's tyrannical. It's to serve one person. And in, even environmentalism, that's the whole point of this. Even environmentalism can be bad. 
It can be that bad food you're eating it because you're like, oh, I want to eat something green. I'm going to vote for environmentalism. Planting trees is so low because you're creating a monoculture, like I said. Mm. And that's tyranny that we're contributing to because we don't want to know. Mm. And so we lost the birch trees. There's barely any birch trees you can build a canoe out of now. Mm -hmm. I know people have to jump the border to do it. <laughs> you know, when you... Um, if 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 you look at clear cutting it's it's a form of genocide mm. it's a form of, well it's not a form it is a genocide is. on the ecosystem mm. and and you want to produce a monoculture well who did that uh, during the second world world who who tried to uh, produce a mono a mono population mm. you know the nazis so yeah, superior race yeah so and and they wanted <clears throat> to produce a superior race in, in the forest you know the forest is is, you know I I you know because being part of ceremony and sitting out and fasting and stuff and and I remember numerous times looking out to the, you know my surrounding our surroundings in the middle of the woods and thinking, this is life this this is how life should be, you have all forms and species of trees just, just being, knowing their role in life. And the insects doing their jobs and watching the ants and the bees and the everything else doing their job, thinking, this is what balance is. Mm -hmm. This is what harmony of life is. You know, we don't need a scientist to tell me <laughs> what, how to live a, a balanced, healthy lifestyle. Yeah. We need food security. We need clean water. We need pure air. Yeah. That's it, it's that simple. And um, Jim, Jim Dumont is a Anishinaabe um, leader. I, I remember a few years back, he, he would come and teach us about the Longhouse teachings. You know, he said, at, at the beginning of time, when, when, when the four races were, were created, we were all given a bundle to take care of. He says, but through time, we started to drop our pieces of our bundles and forget. We started to forget how to live in harmony and balance with life. He says it when the world was created, it was perfect. We had everything we needed to live. But once man started to realize that he can utilize it as a resource or for a monetary gain, is that when the unbalance started to happen. And you know, trying to um, grasp that concept for a Westerner or for a colonized person is difficult because all they see is is, is immediate immediate gratification how they want to live today, and you know um, they don't care you know about you know the seven generations ahead, you know they don't care about the uh, you know their you know, the future of their children their grandchildren and so on, so we have to. Re reclaim and regain, um, and and reclaim those bundles, and 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 to get those bundles back, and 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 take responsibility. It's all about responsibility. As, as 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 one of my <coughs> teachers, um, Harry Laporte, also in Whitscoot, always told me, once you know, you can't say you don't know. No. The trees. <laughs> Thank you for this. It was a wonderful conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yes, it was fantastic. Jared? I enjoyed it, Jared. Very much so. I'm very grateful. Yeah, much respect. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.